Well, David, you're often described as a whistleblower. Some people also say you're a hero. Thank you, everybody! Thank you, David. The Australian public is much richer for his contribution. Then there are those who say you're a traitor. How do you view yourself? I view myself as a soldier who did his job, and that's really what I am. Uh, obviously, I like being called a hero. It, it, it kind of helps when you're in a jail cell. <laughs> Makes you feel a bit better. David McBride is a former military lawyer who blew the whistle. Today, I serve my country. He's celebrated for exposing war crimes in Afghanistan. And what's David McBride's crime? His crime is telling the truth about war crimes. But the truth is, that wasn't his intention. It was entirely the opposite. David McBride wanted to expose that our soldiers were being unfairly targeted, they were being unfairly investigated. It's a much greyer and murkier and messier story than people appreciate. Are you just someone who broke the law and got caught? <laughs> I didn't sell the plans to the Chinese. It wasn't robbing a bank. I say I saw the government breaking the law. With his criminal trial shrouded in secrecy. Right, so they've just closed the court. Now there's a secret hearing taking place upstairs. This is the power of the Attorney General sitting in the middle of a courtroom, ready to gag everybody in a, in a heartbeat. We go inside David McBride's high stakes battle for vindication and ask, what is he really fighting for? I believe I'm still fighting for Australia. My enemies would say the same thing, but I believe I'm right, I believe they're wrong, and I'm still putting my life on the line for this country, just as my oath told me to do. David McBride's criminal trial. Doggy treats. Reality is hitting home. I'm not allowed to take Jake into prison. I'm trying to find someone um, who can do it. Messages from well wishers. Sometimes I'm too anxious to read them. It's easier to read hate mail than it is uh, praise. On social media, McBride is crowdfunding for his legal defence. I'm asking for support from everyday Australians to give a small amount within your capacity to help my campaign. Do you know how much money you've raised over the last few years? Approximately, but it must be around half a million bucks. Important paperwork, Jack. Take that. The back McBride's bail documents list five federal offences. You're playing hide and seek. He's charged with giving secret documents to journalists when he was a lawyer for the Australian Defence Force. It's got the offences on it too. <clears throat> Has it ever occurred to you to run or hide? Quite a few people say, why wouldn't you run? I could, for 20 grand, get you a powerful jet ski, take off from Bondi, <laughs> you'll meet a boat 20 kilometres out, and uh, you get on the boat and they'll take you, uh, <laughs> take you somewhere. And I don't want to spend the rest of my life on the run in a disguise, like Tony Mockbull, but um, it's easy to talk tough when you're sitting in Paddington. See how you go inside a six by four cell, you know? 
Oh, look at their faces. Are you excited? They're very excited. excited. You know something's happening. Yes. Prison is front of mind for McBride. If convicted, he faces years in jail. Left and then right. It's a confronting thought for his daughters Georgie and James and ex-wife Sarah, who stood by him since their separation eight years ago. It's unusual. It's a very unusual situation, but we're best of mates. And when you believe in something strong enough, you'll keep fighting for it. I thought it might be a shortcut. It's been so many years of our life. Most of my childhood had the case in it. And the fact we've been through all the hardships of what the case has done with everyone, and he'd still go to jail, it would be like a loss. Yeah. Legally, it's a difficult case to defend. McBride has already admitted to police that he broke the law by revealing national secrets. His entire defence now rests on proving it was the right thing to do. It would be no such thing as whistleblowers. No. If they get up on this. Because how could you be a whistleblower? If, if, if... You'd be crucified. Mark Davis is the lead solicitor on the case. We assume that it's known what it means, right? But here we are, like eight lawyers going, what does duty mean? I mean, it's really bloody. <laughs> the case is being run under national security laws, which means there are heavy restrictions around the handling of evidence. It's bullshit that anything to do with national security, they used, and I know this because I used to be inside the system, they use this as a weapon to make it harder for defendants. Yeah, you guys will have to clear out because we're just going to go through the documents now, OK? And then you just literally can't see them, that's all. See you. See ya. Yeah, close the door. To understand how David McBride ended up here, we have to go back 11 years to the war in Afghanistan. McBride was on deployment as a lawyer with Australia's Special Forces. I loved my job at Special Forces. I thought it was the best job in the world. Rumours were escalating that war crimes were being committed by members of the SAS. We now know from an independent inquiry called the Brereton Report that there's credible information that 39 Afghans were unlawfully killed by 25 Australian soldiers. At the time, that wasn't McBride's main concern. You were the legal officer for the special forces. What rumours were you hearing at this time? Did you have a sense of those 39 murders yourself? Yeah, I heard the rumours. But uh, as a lawyer, you don't pay too much attention um, to the rumours. And they were my clients. And so I went there with, a, with an open mind. I knew that soldiers weren't angels, particularly special forces soldiers. Um, but I also didn't think that they were all devils. Back in 2013, the ADF decided to reinforce the rules of engagement to say soldiers can only shoot if they have a high degree of confidence a person is a threat. I made a complaint about it to say this could get soldiers killed because it had like a seven step test for a soldier in a firefight with the Taliban as to when he could pull the trigger. And it was just a mess. And at the bottom it said, if you don't follow the seven-step test, basically, you'll be guilty of murder. McBride was outraged when the ADF launched investigations into incidents involving SAS soldiers that he considered to be lawful killings. You don't investigate innocent people in order to make up for the bad people. 
if there is political bullshit going on against soldiers, and it doesn't matter whether they're SAS or not, you need to stand up for them. He ended up putting his job on the line defending a corporal who shot a prisoner. An SAS soldier had captured a Taliban person and then the Taliban person made a, uh, a grab for the SAS soldier's weapon and it was a 30-second struggle for the control of the weapon. Eventually, the SAS guy got his finger on the trigger, pulled the trigger and shot the guy dead. And that's when I said, hang on, everything about this soldier's story looks right. But if uh, you had heard the rumours, why take a stance on that particular investigation to say that this is not a war crime that warrants investigation? Well, you take a stand because it's the right thing to do. This is when McBride's obsession began. He returned to Australia a changed man. I never really came back. And to a certain extent, I've never really returned from that 2013 tour mentally. And Sarah knew it. And the kids, I think, funnily enough, Georgie, who's my youngest daughter, is quite sensitive. I think she knew it. It was hard for us to bond after that tour. I'm trying to find a good way to put it. He... I don't know how to say it. It's like... Yeah, he becomes kind of in his own fairy world. <laughs> That's what we call it. I think mentally it's very different for him. McBride started compiling an internal complaint about the ADF leadership and what he believed was the illegal investigation of SAS soldiers. I tried to let it slide for a while, but I was still boiling on the inside. I knew I was going to go to war against my own country. In his report, McBride described the investigation of five separate incidents as overzealous and driven by appearances. He printed off secret documents inside the Special Operations Headquarters near Canberra and stored them at home. It took me many months, six months probably. But I was still angry about this issue. So I was drinking in order to deal with that anger and I was probably doing a half a bottle of vodka each day, built up to about three quarters of a bottle of vodka every single day. And I wasn't sleeping much. I, I was on ADHD medication, which I was abusing uh, to stay awake all night. I'd frequently stay in the office all night, but everything else in my life fell apart to try to put that complaint together. Were you concerned about him during that time? Absolutely. Very concerned. It wasn't the Dave that I knew. There were times where I had to sit on suicide watch with him. I never expected to become a whistleblower. I was a true believer. But it, there comes a point when um, you see things which are just so wrong, you have to stand up. The first step in trying to make sense of David McBride and his motives is knowing his past. It's quite emotional. A lot of things you've half forgotten. He's the youngest of four children of Dr William McBride. Here we go. This is your life, maybe. That's not a bad photo of the family. The famed Sydney obstetrician was credited with blowing the whistle on the dangers of the pregnancy drug thalidomide in the 1960s. He was obviously well regarded. This is me in the British Army, training for SAS selection in uh, Wales. When David was a young soldier serving in the UK, his father lost his hero status. Dr McBride was found guilty of falsifying research on other pregnancy drugs and forced to stop practising. Once a hero of international medicine, Dr William McBride has been struck off. Our aim, of course... A man of good deeds brought down by a fatal flaw of character. 
Is there a reluctance for you to compare yourself to them in some ways? Yeah, I think so. I can see the analogies, but in a black humid way. I don't want to have too much ego about it. He was world-renowned uh, scientist and he had, a, he had a great public downfall, of course, as well. But that was a lesson for me too, to say um, always be honest, always, always be honest. And if you're in the shit, don't, don't dig it deeper by denying, uh, by denying the obvious. Okay, welcome to the Ops Room. I'm Ghost30, and while that sounds a little bit gimmicky, it's not. The ADF eventually dismissed McBride's complaint and most of his concerns, so he took matters into his own hands. The Ops Room was the brainchild of a guy called Major Dave McBride. He was very smart, very nice, um, but that killed him. In 2016, he started posting videos on social media. McBride was still working for defence at this point. The generals of the Australian Army, probably for their patheticness, they had it in for the Special Forces. Do you think you do come across a bit unstable in those videos? I don't know. I haven't watched them, possibly, but I mean, it, 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 it's not relevant. I was trying to uh, uh, create attention, um, and uh, I was trying to achieve an important mission. He published his internal complaint on a blog he called the Ops Room. One of his grievances was the ADF's recruitment drive to increase the number of women. McBride accused senior leadership of valuing gender over capability. What was it about that that seemed to upset you so much? It was all bullshit. That was, that was the problem. We don't need to look into someone's pants when they join the Defence Force. We take people who are good. We need more good people in the Defence Force. We don't need more men. We don't need more women. We don't need more dark-skinned people. We don't need more Muslims. We need more good people. OK, this is ground zero. Empty bachelor apartment. McBride's life was spiralling out of control by this stage. Separating. He decided to end his marriage with Sarah. In order to have that conversation, I had to get high. I had to take the prescription amphetamines a lot of them because I, it's, it's, it's a very hard conversation to have. But knowing that I would never be the, the father of the family in quite the same way that I was then and knowing, as I remember leaving that day and crying and crying and crying, it still makes me emotional now, but to know that I would never be that person again and um, and what I had lost. And um... It was devastating at the time. It was incredibly hard to hear, but knowing David well enough and what he believed was the right thing to do, I had to go and rather than push against it, I kind of had to go with it. As McBride continued posting online, he drew the attention of a journalist. Dan Oakes is a senior reporter with the ABC's investigations team. He's never spoken publicly about McBride being a source. Finally decided after all this time that it's important that the people know the truth about what happened. It's a much greyer and murkier and messier story than people appreciate. And um, I guess, you know, in the end, that's what it, what it comes down to. Let's go back to the beginning for a bit because I want to understand how it was that you first came across David McBride. Uh, I believe that somebody pointed me towards uh, a website that David McBride had uh, put up. It was clear he had significant inside knowledge, significant experience in this field, and that, you know, quite obviously they had a gripe, and, you know, people who have gripes will talk to you. So that's just like ding, ding, ding for a journalist? Absolutely, yeah. And then it was, you know, a case of, um, yeah, how can I sit down with this guy and, and have a, a more extended chat? 
and we had a long talk about it and I was prepared to give them secret documents. In doing so, I was risking jail myself. I already knew that and that's how much I believed in it. I knew from right from the beginning. McBride handed over his original complaint along with thousands of pages of supporting documents, including classified investigations into SAS soldiers. What was the story that David McBride wanted told? He really simply wanted the story to say that the special forces in Afghanistan were being unfairly targeted and unfairly scrutinised and investigated when they shouldn't have been investigated. So he's starting over here saying that SAS troops are being unfairly targeted and over-investigated. How different then is the story that you ended up pursuing? Well, it was diametrically opposed, wasn't it? The more I looked into it, I couldn't conceive of how anyone would claim that these guys were being too tightly monitored. Um, it was precisely the opposite. I mean, the picture that became clear was just one of Afghanistan being a black hole in which events occurred. What happened out in the field stayed out in the field. And I realised that it was a big story. I was also aware that there had been very little or next to nothing reported about allegations of war crimes to that date. Did you speak to David McBride before the Afghan files were published? I did, I, I rang David and his response was simply, you do what you've got to do. And uh, he hung up. And then the Afghan files were published. Tonight, we reveal serious allegations that Australian soldiers may have committed unlawful killings during Australia's longest war. 7.30 has spoken to 10 other former and current soldiers. They agreed that a culture of recklessness infected some elements of special forces in Afghanistan around who was a legitimate target and who wasn't. I remember the exact moment I saw it and I was about to get on a plane to Sydney and I was like, uh-oh and I knew it was the documents that I'd given them, and I knew they were, I was in the frame. The ADF had discharged McBride six months earlier. When the story broke, they immediately referred the leak to the Australian Federal Police, which launched an investigation. What were you prepared to do to protect McBride as a source? I would have done anything. I mean, anything required. Go to jail? Yeah, absolutely. You can't work as a journalist, I don't think, if you're not willing to go to the absolute lengths, you know, the ends of the earth to protect a source. police were closing in, McBride made the decision to flee to Spain, leaving behind his young family. After a year in hiding, he risked it all, returning to Australia for a father-daughter school dance. I'm dancing with a couple of my friends in the crowd and he comes up behind me and I just turn around. And I was in shock, I put my hands over my mouth and we hug and it was one of the best nights ever actually. It was really, really nice. He did not want to let his daughter down, whatever cost. And that's what then triggered the chain of events once he got back and I received the call that he'd been arrested. In a full confession to police, McBride admitted giving classified documents to Dan Oakes and the ABC. We received an email saying, essentially, this is the federal police, you're a suspect in a crime, I guess seeking our cooperation and asking if we would search our own systems for documents that they were were looking for. And then, you know, I, I guess eventually they realised they were going to have to come in through the front door and, um, and search for it themselves. So what we'd be looking for first, 
members see communications between Mr McBride and Mr Oakes concerning military information. My first reaction was, what are they going to find and what are they going to do with it? The AFP did not find any secret documents at the ABC. How was everything, long day? It was a massive step. I don't think it had been done in Australia before. I mean, it gets to the heart of all those big questions, obviously, about media freedom and national security and the treatment of whistleblowers. Prosecutors ultimately decided charging Dan Oakes was not in the public interest. They persisted with the case against David McBride. I was confronted with the prospect that I was going to walk away scot-free and David was going to be prosecuted. And for me, that was it was really, really difficult to deal with. It had a substantial effect on me. Oakes and McBride haven't spoken since the stories were published. McBride was unhappy with the way the ABC used the documents. But by 2020, his legal team was publicly crediting him with exposing war crimes. Join them on the stage for a photo with our whistles and the whistle three whistleblowers at the front. It's a narrative that media, politicians and human rights groups have since run with. Let's all do this tomorrow at the court today. They've adopted him as a whistleblower and a martyr. And so I wouldn't say it's entirely down to him, but certainly the narrative that's been portrayed is not 100% correct. He never at any point I believe, mentioned war crimes or showed any desire to uncover war crimes or have people punished for war crimes. Stand there and think of nothing. Do you think that he does deserve the public support? Oh, no, he does deserve it. I've got no question. I've got no question about David, that he made a significant difference in revealing the behaviour of Australian forces. He didn't mean to, though. That no, wasn't his uh, intention. I don't think that's correct. It's apparent within the material by the virtue of giving it, by the act of giving it, he wants someone to do something with it. And it's exactly what happened. So there's a duality to McBride. He's defending soldiers who are improperly accused of war crimes. What's wrong with that? I mean, it's a good thing. He should be proud of it. I'd, I'd act for him if that's all he did. My well, jury whisper says, don't wear a tie. <laughs> These are my uh, suits to win the jury over. One, one, one day, one the other day. A few days out from his trial, McBride is packing his bags for Canberra. These are socks from the kids. Ex-wife Sarah is helping him. You've got to look like the everyman, but uh, you're going to go down. You may as well go down looking good, I guess. It looks like Sarah's going to be repacking a lot of this. Yeah, she's going to do it again. She's going to do it properly. I'm very, very, very grateful to have her. Otherwise, I would not be here. I love you very much. No comments right now. <laughs> All right, buddy, you're coming. In court, he'll be supported by his assistant's dog, Jake. Here you go. McBride is diagnosed with PTSD. Okay. He's got everything. On the first day of McBride's criminal trial, his supporters are gathering outside court. Some of his biggest backers are high-profile whistleblowers themselves who exposed corruption and wrongdoing. While I've still got a breath, 
and still got my legs working, um, I'm going to keep supporting David. They've been lobbying the federal government to stop McBride's prosecution, which has cost taxpayers millions. McBride arrives to a hero's welcome. Thank you, everybody! Thank you, everybody! Inside, he'll face prosecutors who deny he's a genuine whistleblower. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. You are part of my family. Today, I serve my country. And the question I have for you, Anthony Albanese, is who do you serve? The case gets underway. The judge hears legal argument on a pivotal issue, the definition of a soldier's duty. Prosecutors say it's about obeying orders. McBride's defence says soldiers have a higher duty to serve Australia's national interest. Mark, can we grab you for a sec? There seems to be a lot riding on this argument of uh, duty. Is there any point in the Crown continuing if you win the argument? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a central issue. If we win it, uh, well, we'll be pretty happy. I mean, it's a very difficult mountain for us to climb. A lot is riding on the failure or success of today's uh, argument. OK. After two days of legal argument, it's finally D-Day for the definition of duty. Either way, I think the judge will be against us on the duty question. What kind of toll is this taking on you personally at this stage of things? I'm pretty strong. Uh, it's just about killed me. And, and there, there are plenty of people who wouldn't survive this. If I ended up being treated as a traitor and a, a pariah, it, it would be really effing hard for me to go on, I have to say. Today I feel all right. I'm, I'm looking forward to tell my full story, but there are times when I am really close. That, that, that's a lot to, to say out, out loud at this mm. point. Yeah. It gives one my confidence and I can, you know, I don't mind sharing that with you, but yeah, no, I, I was close the other night. Inside, Justice David Mossop hands down his decision. much happened. So just explain to me what happened in there. Well, the judge went through all our arguments yesterday to say, what does duty mean? And he downed the ball and he said, duty just means what to do what you're told uh, by your superiors. There's no exceptions, there's no defence. His barristers have one last shot. They ask for leave to appeal the judge's decision the next day. But there's a bigger obstacle to McBride's defence, and it's playing out in secret under national security laws. 
Right, so they've just closed the court. Now there's a secret hearing taking place upstairs and all we know is that it relates to sensitive intelligence information that involves Australia's allies. It's a unique situation. The federal government is an extra party in court with its own legal team. They want to remove certain documents from the trial that McBride wants for his defence, claiming it's in the public interest to withhold the information. It's a secrecy provision where the government says you're not going to reveal that document in a courtroom. It's walking in, thief in the night, and walking out. Have you seen him? Is he here? The following day, things go from bad to worse. You all right, David? Yeah, a bit frazzled. McBride loses his bid to appeal the judge's ruling on the definition of duty. This means the jury will be told there are no exceptions to a soldier following orders. Something seems to be brewing. The secret hearing is still taking place upstairs, but David McBride and his senior legal team have now left court quite suddenly to have a meeting together. Uh, it seems like an emergency briefing of some kind, which suggests that there could be a dramatic turn of events this afternoon. McBride's defence is in crisis. Mark Davis says national security laws are already hampering their defence, but if the government has its way, McBride can only lose. It is fatal to a fair trial. He has no chance. No chance if they can walk off with the evidence. What chance can you have before a jury? Thank you so much, George. He's the best hugger, even as a little... One-year-olds used to come in and give me hugs. <laughs> the next morning, McBride's lawyers ask to see him urgently. <sighs> Thank you for everything. OK, see you later. I couldn't say exactly what on the phone, but it sounds like we're going to talk about a plea deal. I've always said, I will never give up on this and I will never plead guilty. It may be, but that's what I have to do. Plead guilty, hold my head up high and say, well, if that's the law, that's the law. McBride has waited five years to defend himself in front of a jury. Come on. could all be about to end before he even takes the stand. There it is. Hi. McBride has made up his mind. He's going to plead guilty. I bought you a jacket and a shirt, but it's up That's in good. the chambers. With a few minutes to spare before court, he sits down with us. It's just an emotional time. I said, even if I'd won the case, the first thing um, I want to do it was cry. You, you, you hold the emotions down for as long as you possibly can, and whatever happens, whenever you change from one phase to another, emotion comes out and then you sleep and you reset and you get charged and then wake up and start on start on the next phase now speaking of which i've got to go across yes jake thanks david Thank you. we'll see you up there 
In a deal with prosecutors, McBride pleads guilty to one charge of stealing and two charges of unlawfully sharing secret military information. Mark Davis and uh, Dave McBride. The judge upholds the federal government's bid to remove evidence from his defence. An extra burden today was that the Crown, the, the government, was given authority to bundle up evidence and run out the back door with it. They've taken it from us. He's no longer able to put it before a jury. That is a fatal blow. It makes it impossible for us, realistically, to, uh, to, to go to trial. I'm not giving up hope. He's done the right thing. I've said that from the beginning. Truth and justice will prevail. And I'm incredibly proud of him, as are his two girls. McBride is allowed out on bail until sentencing. I will never back down from believing in that this was the right thing for him to do. McBride is fighting to keep his name in the headlines. Today, he's doing a photo shoot for the cover of a magazine. You do have to have a little bit of showmanship. You do have to get out there and spruik yourself. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. But if you want to win, you have to do it. Do you like the attention? I don't hate it, but I just, I'm aware I'm aware that it brings enemies as, as, as well as, uh, as fans. Great. Not all the publicity is favourable. The credit he's received for exposing war crimes is now being scrutinised. He was not blowing the whistle to reveal war crimes. He has acknowledged he was doing the reverse. I don't derive any pleasure from the fact that people are now becoming aware of what David McBride was claiming when he first came forward. I just think it's, it's important that the truth is told. All the evidence to date, evidence that we uncovered at the ABC, other journalists have uncovered, Justice Brereton uncovered, it's clear now that there, this is a significant problem, that, that our guys over there were insufficiently restrained and probably should have been investigated more. Dan Oak's reporting has come at a great personal cost. I don't like it when I see journalists becoming the story. Um, I don't like it at all, and it's... Uh, so it's quite awkward sitting here discussing this. Look, it had a significant effect. It had a massive effect on me mentally and morally and, and even physically. You know, I became quite unrecognisable as the person that I was. And the people around me, really, they were the ones that paid the price for that. There you go. What triggered that aftermath for you? For me, it was always guilt and shame um, about what happened to David. David is the one that's going to pay the price for this, um, not me. Um, and. But yeah, I, I don't think there's ever going to be a time where I don't feel some guilt and shame over the fact that that happened. Whether I'm a war crimes whistleblower or a defence force whistleblower, it doesn't really matter in the sense that I'm someone that stood up for what I believed in and I'm prepared to go to jail for it. David McBride says he's never wavered in what he believes in. 
You have been made out as though you exposed war crimes, but that actually wasn't your intention. You were saying that the SAS were being over-investigated. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? I've always been about the leadership. The war crimes were a symptom of that. I think they were a symptom of bad leadership. And the people in my sights have always been the generals. Certain parts of the media may have misunderstood uh, what I stood up for, but if people don't understand me, that won't kill me. McBride will find out his fate later this year. I don't want to go to jail, but I'm not afraid of it, in that I'm very much focused on the mission, and the mission is not to avoid jail, it's not to go to jail, it's to get change in Australia. Uh, now, I will do that whichever way I can. Jail may be uh, just uh, a phase in that operation. So you going to jail, you think, might prove that point? Something dark inside of me says it's the only way it's going to happen. If this program has raised concerns for you, you can contact one of these services.